Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining our Woo You event. Uh, we're going to be honored by Dr. Melanie Fergozo speaking with us on scleral lens fundamentals. So I'm your host for today. My name is Dr. Ariel Sorenzi. So I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Melanie Fergozo. She completed her residency in cornea and contact lenses at the University of Houston College of Optometry. After that residency, she took a faculty position at the University of Iowa in the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences, where she continued to develop her specialty. She is the owner of Alamo Eye Care and the director of the Contact Lens Institute of San Antonio, located in San Antonio, Texas. She is also a diplomat of the Cornea, Contact Lens, and Refractive Technologies section of the American Academy of Optometry, a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society, and a council member of the Contact Lens section of the American Optometric Association, a member of the Texas Optometric Association, and she frequently enjoys lecturing and is a regular columnist in the Contact Lens spectrum. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, and we uh, are so excited for your presentation. Thank you so much, Ariel. And uh, before we get started, just a few um, financial disclosures is that I am a consultant for both CooperVision and then Lentex. So first of all, I wanna thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join me tonight. I'm really excited about sharing this information about scleral lenses. Um, scleral lenses are very dear to me. Um, they have grown my practice both professionally and then also they, they support um, my whole practice, my family. Um, once you get really good at, at fitting these, you're able to help so many patients and you're able to grow your practice. So I'm really excited about sharing this information about, about scleral lenses. So let's go ahead and get started. First, I wanna talk about the anatomy of a scleral lens. So this is a large diameter guest permeable lens that completely vaults over the cornea and rests on the white part of the eye, the scleroconjunctival shape. And so the picture at the very bottom is a picture of a, of a well-centered scleral lens. This is to be differentiated from corneal lenses, which are the pictures on the top. A corneal lens, which rests most of its weight in, on the middle of the cornea, and then an intralimbal corneal lens which rests its weight on the mid peripheral cornea. So to look at one of these on side view, again, the scleral lens completely vaults over the corneal surface and rests on the scleral conjunctival shape. In between the back surface of the lens and the front surface of the cornea, it's filled with a liquid reservoir. Typically this is preservative free saline solution, but it can also be filled with preservative-free medications and be used for a liquid bandage contact lens. And so you can see how this can be very advantageous in this picture, this cartoon character, um, this um, is an irregular cornea. So it completely vaults over irregular corneal surfaces and rests on what's typically an unaltered conjunctival scleral shape. So here we're, we're looking at um, the scleral lenses. I like to look at it in sections. Um, the largest section, which is the chamber, which go, goes ahead and vaults over the cornea. And this encompasses the, the central cornea, the mid peripheral cornea, and also the limbal area. The limbal area is the area between the scleral conjunctiva and the cornea, the clear part of the eye, which rests above the iris, the colored part of the eye. And this is a line of demarcation. This is a very important area because this is where our precious limbal stem cells actually survive and live. And these cells rejuvenate the epithelial surface. And so it's very important to be mindful of the whole entire cornea, especially this limbal area. So also, past the chamber is the landing area. This landing area again rests on the scleral conjunctival shape. And this is where the majority of, of, of the weight bears on a full scleral lens. To look at this on side view, you can see here on parallel pipette, and the, the fluid reservoir that rests between the corneal surface and the back surface of the scleral contact lens. So to look at scleral lenses a little bit closer definition wise, 
Full scleral lenses are lenses that completely vault the corneal surface and the weight rests on the white part of the eye, the scleral conjunctival shape. This is to be differentiated from a corneal scleral lens where part of the weight actually rests on the cornea and some of the weight rests on the sclera and the corneal lens, which all of the weight rests on the cornea. Before there were debates on how to define the scleral lens and it was it was defined by diameter, but you know now we're looking at it based on HVID or horizontal visible iris diameter. So for example, if you have a patient who has a mini uh, microcornea, excuse me, of 11 millimeters, um, a 15 millimeter lens, scleral lens could be a full scleral lens. But if you have a patient who has a megalocornea, 12.5 millimeters or even 13 millimeter lens, a 15 millimeter lens is gonna be a corneal scleral lens. Um, and so it really just depends on the size of the, the actual HVID, the cornea. And, and for a megalocornea, an 18 or a 20 millimeter lens will be a full scleral lens. So typically you fit these lenses based on, you know, what you're, you're trying to, to, cut, to treat. So the larger the irregularity, the larger the lens. If you have a patient who has ocular surface disease, then you would also go ahead and, and go larger because you want to cover most of the eye to protect the eye. And there are considerations for gas permeability. Since these lenses are larger, is that of course you would um, go ahead and guess that this would decrease the amount of oxygen. So we need to make sure that the lens material is high in decay. And there are considerations for tear film because the, this does change the decay of the lens. And I'll talk about this a little bit later. So uses of scleral lenses. And so the primary indication is corneal ectasia, irregular corneas like keratoglobus, pollution marginal degeneration and keratoconus like this bottom picture here, or irregular astigmatism, patients who have corneal scarring. So patients here who have um, Salzman's nodular degeneration or lattice corneal dystrophy or scar tissue from trauma. And next is ocular surface disease. If you take a look at a cornea like this, you would think, gosh, I'm not sure if I wanna put a, a any kind of contact lens. But as we know, bandage contact lenses help heal surface disease. And so with a scleral lens, this has a liquid bandage, a liquid reservoir that can help heal the cornea. And on top of that, it's made of a hard lens material that does not dehydrate. And so this is advantageous because it's a physical barrier from the environment, the shearing environment of the lids, and then also the environment from rough, rough air environments. And so last is high refractive error. So patients, you've seen this before, who have high myopia or hyperopia, these lenses, these corneal lenses can be especially heavy and they tend to decenter. and patients look through, you know, a partial optic zone. But with a scleral lens, you can go ahead and manipulate curves to make the lens thinner, less plus or minus, open up the size of the optic zone and the patient sees much better. And because these large lenses tuck underneath the lens and, se and semi-suction onto the eye, they center better and the vision is, is much better through a scleral lens for, for some of these patients. And so another example is, you know, patients who you have in suboptimal fitting corneal GP lenses. So here's a picture of a patient, you know, who has some sort of scar where the lens is decentering more um, nasal. And so this patient isn't seeing very well because they're partially seeing through part of an optic zone. The lens is tilted, so it's causing residual astigmatism most likely. And every time they blink, you can tell because there's so much edge lift, this lens moves around. So with a scleral contact lens in place is that this is gonna completely vault over that scar rest on the white part of the eye and it won't move and this patient will have improved vision. And because the lens doesn't move, it also increases the comfort of, of the patient. So these lenses are really remarkable devices. Learning how to fit them is really a game changer for a lot of these patients who are in big need. So what, who, who else are candidates? You know, is it, you know, only a certain age population? I would argue to say no, it's for anybody who needs it. Pediatrics to geriatrics. And lots of the, the um, hesitation for fitting special needs patients, special populations like pediatrics or geriatrics is, 
Will my patient be able to insert or remove the lens? If the patient has, you know, a medical concern and if you can improve vision or help the quality of your life, you, you, you can't even imagine how motivated these patients are. They will do anything to be able to gain that, that, um, that freedom and that, in that improvement in lifestyle. So if the patient, if you can't teach the patient, you can also teach parents, caregivers, siblings, anyone in the family, spouses. There's also the device for patients, you know, who have, you know, any kind of a special needs. So plunger devices, handheld devices um, that will help put in scleral lenses and take them out. When there's a will, there's a way. If the patient needs help, is that these lenses will def, will be life-changing for them and you just have to troubleshoot and, and you and the patient will figure it out together. So how to fit scleral lenses, time to get to the fun part. So there's two ways you can use diagnostic fitting and technology. I'm a humongous fan of diagnostic fitting. I think once you learn how to use your diagnostic fitting sets, Hands down, it is much quicker than, you know, even using tech time to use technology. Um, there is technology now available, which is very helpful in troubleshooting scleral lenses and, and even difficult patients helping design the lenses fully. Ocular coherence tomography or OCT and scleral topographies and tomographers are available in order to help you fit scleral lenses. But the majority of my lecture is going to be about diagnosing fitting because I'm a big fan of this. Again, I would say 97% of my patient population is diagnostically fitted. And the 3%, then I, I do use to pop, um, I have a scleral topographer in my office. And so, but most of my patients are diagnostically fitted because I think it's, it's, it's much quicker. And the fitting sets these days um, can fit most of your most of your patients. There's so many parameters available. So how do we pick the first lens? So I like to pick by looking at the patient's scleral, uh, scleral and corneal profile or their whole ocular profile. So this is differentiated from fitting corneal lenses where you're just looking at the corneal profile. And scleral lenses, we are fitting the whole ocular sagittal depth. So the, uh, the, the scleral conjunctiva and the cornea. And so looking at this from side view, so this picture to the right is a patient with severe keratoconus. You can look at that and say, that's a pretty steep profile. So for my fitting set, I would grab a steep sagittal depth lens or a steeper base curve and place it on and take a look at the lens in the middle to see if it's, if it's vaulting. Um, if they have a flatter profile in a patient who has maybe like an oblate uh, corneal transplant or a patient who's very oblate in their radio keratotomy, you may grab a flatter sagittal depth or a flatter base curve. And if you really can't tell, just put a lens on. That is your 100% your best topography. You can tell whether there's not enough clearance, too much clearance, and you adjust from there. Typically, this is what I do is I tell them I have... Um, very good staff, very good technicians. I just have them take a lens from the middle of the set, they put it on, and then they fit from OCT. They take a look at this, the, 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 the amount of space between the back surface of the lens and the front surface of the eye, and then they change it until they get it. They get what I consider an ideal a clearance, and I'll discuss this later later on in my my lecture. And then they they move forward, and so. Really, it just depends on the shape of the eye, but there's multiple ways to to get to the to the right to the right lens. So again, this is much differentiated um, from corneal GP lens fitting. So with corneal lenses, especially with regular corneas, it's very uh, predictable. You can fit based on keratometry values. Get an empirical lens fits great. Even with an irregular cornea with keratoconus, keratoconus, excuse me, you can use the elevation map, look at the best fit sphere and get kind of a decent-ish lens. But you actually can't look at the corneal topography and, and make an, a, an indication on what scleral lens you need because 
With a scleral lens, again, we're not fitting the cornea at all. We're completely bypassing the cornea and we're fitting the, the, scleral, the scleral conjunctival shape and we're vaulting the whole ocular sagittal depth. So that is that, that is what we're, we're fitting. And so you can't really look at your topography and, and base your, your first lens on that. I take topography more for monitoring purposes. I don't really look at it in, in order to design scleral lenses. And so what about medications? A lot of these patients have lots of comorbidities. We'd make the joke when I was in, in um, the hospital is that your, one, your patient can't just have one thing. If they have one, one thing, it's, 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 it's paired with multiple things. And so typically they have um, comorbidities like glaucoma or ocular surface disease, severe dry eye. So you have to be mindful of the medications that you're putting with the lens. Um, Preservative-free tears are most ideal for these patients because they, they tend to have surface concerns. Um, scheduling of the medications is very important because this lens does semi-suction onto the eye is that if you try to put the medications on the scleral lens, there's not going to be enough exchange into the cornea and so they might not get their therapeutic effect. You want to make sure you dose their medications before insertion and, and after, after removal. And then also to be mindful of medications that can harm the surface of the eye. So a lot of my patients with keratoconus, there is a higher incidence of glaucoma in these patients. So they sometimes they do have glaucoma and being mindful that this could also irritate the cornea and, and co-managing if possible to decrease the amount of preservatives that goes onto the eye in order to help the ocular surface and help the vision and help the eye stay comfortably in the scleral contact lens. So let's get to evaluating the scleral lens. Um, I wanna talk about clearance. This is the first thing I look. So clearance is the area between the cornea and the back surface of the lens. And so this is a nice picture of an OCT over, the scl over a scleral contact lens. So the cornea is at the bottom and the scleral lens is on the top. And in between that space, that, that is the clearance. Um, to the right of this is a picture of a parallel pipe pipette with fluorescein in the vault of the scleral lens. So you take your scleral lens, you fill it with preservative-free saline, and you dip a little fluorescein stick until it turns bright green like that. And this is how you put the scleral lens. You put the scleral lens on like on like that onto the eye, and then you're able to assess full the, the clearance. And so you take a look at this on optic section. Um, now with lens, the lens does settle onto the eye. The, the cornea, I'm sorry, the, the, the sclera is covered by the conjunctiva and the kind of conjunctiva is in, in, in some patients is, squish, is more squishier than others. So there is lens settling and this can occur between one to eight hours. Um, on average, it does plateau at two hours. And there was a good study um, put out by Matt Kaufman, I think in 2013 and his colleagues in Missouri, where he took a look at lens settling. And in his papers, it said about 70 to 80 microns within the first 30 minutes. So planning for this is, is, is good when you're measuring the vault of the lens. Um, when I was in my residency, I did do another hospital rotation and they would make the patient sit there the whole entire day, six hours to look at lens settling. When you're in a busy private practice seeing multiple patients, um, really uh, what I do is I put the lens on and I just go ahead and I subtract automatically 100 microns. So for example, if I want the vault to be you know, 200 microns, I plan for the lens to be you know, anywhere between two, 270 to 300, 300 microns upon installation. And, and we know that the vault is going to drop to 200, which I, and, and for most of my patients, I believe is, is ideal. So this is a little bit of a better um, picture of vault um, presentation. This comes from the Michigan um, College of Optometry's website. Um, this is really nice. So how to assess the, the vault of the lens. This is by far the most difficult thing to learn when you're first fitting scleral lenses. 
um, you can compare this to the thickness of the cornea, which in normal corneas is around 500 microns. If you you know you you've done this, you, you've been a practitioner for a while, you know what a normal corneal thickness looks like. It's about 500 microns. You can uh, you know almost imagine it when you're going past and scanning scanning the cornea, corneal corneal shape. Um, so looking at this and comparing it to the vault of the lens, so in this picture here, this very first picture, you can see that it's a little more than half of the cornea, so 300 microns. And then, you know, it's thinner in th these pictures and thicker in these pictures. So I like to base it based off of the a normal corneal shape. Um, with some, some doctors, they like to base it off of the patient's thickness of their cornea if they have their pack, pack reading. Um, or you can base it off the thickness of the lens. And so you would have to have your invoice, which sometimes I don't necessarily have. Um, so I like to personally base it off of, off of the cornea. So a little bit more about oxygen um, transmissibility. Um, so you, you would, we talked about how we need these lenses to be high in decay. But what about that fluid reservoir? Does it retard any oxygen going to the cornea? This could be potentially a concern for patients who you know, have de decompensated endotheliums or endothelial dystrophy. So there was a paper put out by Langi Michaud and his colleagues in, in um, Canada, excuse me, where they actually looked at this in a hypothetical situation. And so in their paper, I believe they looked at a lens that was over 150 DK and a tear film reservoir of 200 microns was enough to allow the proper amount of oxygen to the eye. This is all hypothetical. Um, oh, and the thickness I think was 0.1, um, 0.1 millimeters. Um, this is all hypothetical um, in a patient who has endothelial decompensation versus, you know, a patient who has keratoconus and who's 20 and normal healthy endothelium is that that patient may have a lower oxygen demand versus a patient who has endothelial decompensation or corneal transplant. So, you know, 200 microns is where I like to rest my lens, but it really depends on the patient is I typically see my scleral lens patients um, after I finalize the lens within three to six months, depending on the severity of the disease. If their disease is actually stable, like in patients who have keratoconus and they're past 40 years old, um, after that year, I'll actually see them yearly. So it really depends. If you're concerned, see the patient back more. Um, again, the, the the vault of the lens, is, lens there is, you know, and I, I think from, from my patients, it's around 200 microns to 150 to 200 microns, but really it can be variable from patient to patient. And also the shape of the cornea and what you're trying to, to manage too. So assessment of the chamber and of course the limbal area. So these top pictures here are pictures of a lens that's well-centered. So this is a well-centered lens. You can see here the fluorescein is, is nice and evenly distributed. And you wanna take a look at the limbus and make sure that there's enough clearance. Here's an OCT of it clearing the limbal area, very important. Um, now, sometimes what happens if you have a lens too steep or if the, the, the alignment, I'm sorry, the, the landing curve is not uh, completely aligned with the scleral conjunctival shape, you may get decentration. So these pictures below are lenses decentered inferior temporally, and you can tell because the fluorescein is more deeper and darker, more inferiorly, and then there's less fluorescein or even probably touch to bearing in the superior area here in this picture. Um, and you can see this on OCT because the fluid reservoir, this is over the central cornea, are more towards the, the, the top here. And then this, the, the, the central cornea here is, is, is uneven. And so the most ideal situation is that if you can have an even fluid reservoir um, and, and best centration, of course, is if you, you fit, you know, specialty lenses is that we want to try to find the best fit lens that's comfortable and physiologically not harming the eye. It does not necessarily have to be, or sometimes it can't be perfect, but making sure that it's not harming any of the, of the structures of the eye or the patient in any kind of way. That's what I consider an ideal fit. 
So bearing of the limbus, this is really bad. Um, so this picture, see, you could see here around the limbal area, this demarcation line is completely no fluorescein. It's bearing. This is bad because again, this is where these precious limbal stem cells um, live. And limbal stem cells we know are not rejuvenated. Once they die off, they go bye-bye and you can leave the patient um, with limbal stem cell deficiency, which can cause corneal scarring and for the conjunctival sclera to, to take over the cornea and, and complete opacification of the cornea. So we definitely want to respect this area and we want to bolt the limbus 100% for sure. We can't do a corneal scleral lens bearing the limbus. We can put some weight, you know, and, and, you know, maybe in the central mid peripheral cornea, you've seen this fitting, you know, keratoconic patients with what we call a, a three, um, three point touch, but you can't put any weight on the limbus. So one thing to remember from this lecture, when you're fitting scleral lenses, no weight on the limbus whatsoever. So you can also, when looking at the chamber, you can have bearing on the cor cornea. So we talked about, you know, light touches, feather touch is fine, distributing the weight between the cornea and the scleral conjunctival shape, but you don't want frank bearing where the majority of the weight is on the cornea. This is bad because when you remove the lens, um, that you can get epithelial erosion or even frank abrasion. And through time, you know, these patients, it's, it's interesting, your, your keratoconic patients are some of your most rewarding patients, but they will not complain. And the reason why is because they don't want to be taken out of the lenses. So they might not even tell you that they're, they're, they're in pain. Um, so a lot of times they'll let you go if you're not assessing the lens properly and you miss this as though they, they can come back with a scar. So you want to make sure, you know, that you're, you're not putting too much, a little bit of weight for a corneal scleral lens, but on a full scleral lens, no, no weight. And, if, and ideally, you know, you put most of the weight on the, um, on the scleral, the scleral conjunctival shape. So if we were to have some of these changes, how would we address them? Is that we have to increase or decrease the sagittal depth. So scleral lenses are the same as corneal lenses, the same as soft lenses, all in orthokeratology lenses and fitting philosophy with respect to sagittal depth. There's only two ways to fix or change sagittal depth, two ways only either to increase or decrease the diameter or flatten or steepen a curvature on the lens. And the larger the curvature that you flatten or steepen, the more it will bring or raise the lens. So for example, I'm gonna go back here on these patients in the middle, I would go ahead and increase the central sagittal depth of the lens. If this lens is based on radius of curvature, I might increase the base curve. And on the patient, who has complete limbal bearing, I would increase the sagittal depth by going larger, increasing the size of the chamber, the chamber sagittal depth and vaulting over, over the limbus. So I would say your second pearl taking away from, from this is, is how to change the sagittal depth of the lens, only two ways, increasing, decreasing the diameter or flattening or steepening some curvature on the lens. The bigger the curve, the more effect on the sagittal depth. So next we wanna go ahead and look at the landing area, the area that rests on the conjunctival scleral shape. The second picture is the most ideal situation. So you can see here on the landing, all the vessels are going straight through the lens, but in the patient to the right, all of a sudden the vessels stop. And that's because the edge of the lens is starting to dig into the vessels and this is called impingement. Um, this is bad also. This can cause limbal stem cell deficiency a different way because the limbus we now know has to have vasculature, has to be, has to be vascularized near that area in order to feed nutrition to the limbus. So if you have impingement that's too close or too much all the way around, this can harm the nutrition of the limbal stem cells. So, and then there's severe impingement more to the left. And opposite to this is edge lift. So when the edge of the lens is actually um, fluting up over the conjunctival scleral shape, 
And this can be uncomfortable because the patient can, can feel the lens. And so impingement and, and um, edge lift can be caused by different, different things. So for, um, for edge lift, this can be caused by a lens that's too flat on the cornea. What happens if the lens is too flat, then it just rests on the cornea and it doesn't actually applinate to the, the scleral conjunctival shape. So here you would increase the sagittal depth of the lens, or it could be just because that meridian of the scleral conjunctiva is steeper and the lens edge is too flat. In this case, you would go ahead and steepen that, that area. And for impingement, the same thing is that there can be maybe some flatness in that area and that edge is too steep. And so it can go ahead and dig dig in, dig into the cornea. And in this case, you would wanna go ahead and flat, flatten the edge. And sometimes you can see this in, in, in meridians that are opposite from each other. And you can add what we call a toric um, edge, which means you can actually steepen or flatten certain meridians. And I'll actually show you an example of this in just a little bit here. So these are some other pictures of impingement. So you can see here, blood vessels are, are starting to go away. This is impingement on a pinguecula. And so these, these are actually fairly common. A couple of things that you can do is you can consider some lenses have the option for actually vaulting over, has a special area where you can incorporate to vault over that area. You can notch the lens, ask your consultant to notch and measure the lens, so remove physical plastic. Um, and so, and other pictures here of impingement. So these are, are not ideals that you would want to go ahead and change the edge in some way. Um, so here are OCTs of impingement. So you can see here that the lens is digging in to the conjunctival shape, increasing in severity here from, from, from left to right, which we call, we call towing. So edge lift. So here you can see with the edge is that there's bubbles that are going into the lens. And so if you see this, sometimes it can be hard to tell, but if you put fluorescein in and you start to see, you know, the, the, the flow of, of fluorescein in, one, in, in a quadrant or bubbles that, that are going in, you can assume that there, there's edge lift in, in this area. And so here, another ex example of this. So let's talk about how we can fix um, edge lift or impingement that are in opposite meridians. So we let's let's start to talk first about uh, corneal astigmatism. So we're all used to with the rule or against the rule corneal astigmatism. So you can also have corneal scler or I'm sorry, um, scleral astigmatism. So typically with the 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 um, the scleral shape is it's flatter in the horizontal meridian and it's steeper in the, the vertical meridian. So it's more of a, a with, with the rule, most, most eyeballs are, are this way. A lot of eyes have, you know, some amount of tericity. Sometimes you can get past and, 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 and use a nice spherical lens, so a lens that's completely round, but in some cases you could get lift you know, typically superior and inferiorly or impingement when the flat meridian at three and nine nasally and temporally. So how do we fix this is that we can go ahead and change the curvature in these meridians by adding a toric, just like how you would add a toric on a corneal lens, you can add a toric and this is just in the landing. So the chamber of the lens stays sphere, spherical, but this is just the, the where it lands on the eye is you can tuck it in. And what a toric means is it basically is it's, it's not round. You've, you've tucked it in. So one shape, part of the, uh, the part of the lens has a different shape than the other. And so that's considered a toric. So in this case, this patient you can see here has fluorescein steepened in superior and inferiorly. So it looks like that it's steeper here. So they have with, with the rule um, scleral tericity. And so how you would fix this is you could go ahead and steepen at both 12 and, 12 and six. And this is just a side profile of what a toric lens looks like. 
a spherical lens would look flat all the way around, you know, circle would be spherical. A toric, you know, this has kind of like an ovoid shape. So it, it's, it's steeper and in uh, this side and this side view in the in this in the horizontal meridian and then flatter here on the on the vertical meridian here on, on this picture. So I want to go ahead and also review some of the things that you might see when you're fitting scleral lenses. This is probably the most common thing patients complain of um, that alters their vision um, is scleral lens fogging. So what is scleral lens fogging? Um, it can be multiple things, but basically what scleral lens fogging is, is that the vault of the lens, instead of it being clear, you'll look at it and it will look foggy. And the patients will tell you, my vision is foggy. And when I remove the lens and I reinsert it, it's clearer, it's clearer again. So this is called midday fog. This can be due to multiple, multiple things. Um, you can see it most often in patients with ocular surface disease, patients who have dry eye. It could be a mix of epithelial, um, you know, uh, mucus cells. It can be, you know, we don't know exactly what, what creates the fogging, um, but we do know that the higher the vault um, of, of the lens, the patient is more noticing of the fogging. So for instance, if you have a vault that's 500 microns with fog versus a vault that's only 150 microns of fog, the patient with the 500 micron vault of fog in their lens is going to complain more than the vision, the patient with a vision of 150 microns of vault because that's easier to see through in a foggy lens. So fixed troubleshooting this is of course, treating the ocular surface disease. And through time, the scleral, a scleral lens, if you're using this, is that this may be a complication at first, but it does get better through time. So just coaching the patient about this um, or changing the vault of the lens so it's physically less noticeable. Something else, a nice trick is that you can put preservative-free, more viscous solution in the bowl of the lens. And this actually just helps retard the the uh, migration of just junk in the bowl, bowl of the lens. So for instance, I had a patient today where we educated him on doing this and he would get scleral lens fogging first before he was doing this in an hour. But after he added the preservative free um, solution or preservative free, free viscous tears in the bowl of his lens, he reported that he didn't get scleral lens fogging until five to six hours. So sometimes adding, um, lubrication in the bowl of the lens will decrease or retard the, the, um, the frequency of uh, the onset of fogging. Um, something that you may see on the surface of the lens is, is non-wetting or deposits or filaments. So if patients have dry eye, what happens is that instead of their, their cornea being dry or their, their, their conjunctival tissue is now the front surface of the lens is now the front surface of their eye. So the surface of their eye gets dry. So making sure that you're treating um, surf, surface, di surface disease as well as possible, um, lubricating the eyes. You can also have the patient remove the lens and clean off and squeegee off the lens throughout the day, you know, if, if needed. So more about um, scleral lens deposits, deposits and fogging is that you can go ahead and use surface treatments, which are available through all of the laboratories. There is a, a plasma treatment and also Hydropeg, which is very, very good um, and deposit resistance and helps wettability of, of the lens. Um, considering, you know, cleaners, stronger cleaners for the patient, um, bi-weekly clean, bi -weekly cleaners, um, by monthly, month, even weekly cleaners is that you can use stronger, stronger solutions, hydrogen peroxide based solutions, and then um, chemical solutions such as Progen. And then of course, treating the actual problem, trying to treat the surface disease, um, you know, thinking about meibomian gland expression, um, treating with topicals in order to increase the tear, tear, film, tear film reservoir, um, punctal plugs, um, co-managing if the patient has systemic illness or disease, a lot of the times their surface disease will not get better unless you actually co-manage with another doctor to treat their systemic illness or disease. So thinking more to get the patient um, 
you know, comfortable in the lens. I would say, you know, my first subspecialty is, is specialty lenses. My second subspecialty actually is dry eye and ocular surface disease because we have to admit it, we all love contact lenses, but what they do cause iatrogenic dry eye. And we're in the business of keeping patients comfortable in their lenses. So we have to understand and know how to treat dry eye. And a lot of these patients have dry eye because they don't have one thing wrong with them. So it's very important for you to become in tune with this, to be a successful specialty lens and especially scleral lens fitters to be second. Your second subspecialty is going to be surface disease. I promise you. <laughs> So something else that you can see in the vault of the lens is, is the conjunctival tissue. So we talked about how the conjunctival tissue is spongy, especially in patients who have dry eye. We know cholesis is, is more, of, more of a concern as, as you gain more maturity, you know, stuff becomes loose and there's more cholesis. And so sometimes what happens is when you're fitting a scleral lens, you can actually see white near the limbus and that that's actually conjunctival prolapse or conjunctival tissue being sucked into the lens. Um, this can be more um, induced if the vault of the lens is excessive, causing a negative suction, pulling the, the conjunctival tissue into the bowl of the lens. Um, but sometimes it's kind of unavoidable with patients who have severe surface disease. I monitor it if it's not harming the limbus or causing any kind of inflammation. For some patients, it is you know, a physical uh, irritation. They can feel it on the lens, they can feel it on the blink. And in that case, I'm not afraid to refer to my, to, to my surgeons and they're more than happy to either do a conjunctival resection where they just completely pull off the whole conjunctiva and so that they can have more conjunctiva for it to, to grow back in a more flatter area. Or less invasive is that they can do cautery where they just remove that certain area that maybe there's prolapse and, and causing the problem, they'll just remove, remove one section. And this will help with the fit of the lens. So something else that you'll see um, when you remove the lens, you're, you'll see sometimes this negative staining and this kind of wrinkly pattern. And almost kind of looks like when you go swimming and you, or you're, you're taking a bath and you look at your fingers and they look wrinkly, looks very similar. So this is called epithelial bogging. And we're not exactly sure what this is caused by. It may be, you know, again, is that the water is being bogged into the epithelial tissues. Maybe it's some sort of electrolyte imbalance that then fixes itself through time is that this is very common. It's benign. It does not alter the patient's vision. It does go away. The cornea and, and some patients even adapts and through time it does go away, but nothing to be frightened about when you remove the lens, this is fine. When you remove the lens, what you want to look for when you stain the eye is any positive staining on the cornea with fluorescein. I also love lysamine green to see if there's any positive staining in the uh, conjunctival scleral, scleral area to make sure that I'm not causing any harm to that area as well. So next, I want to go ahead and, and talk about technology. So there's scleral topographies and scleral tomographers. And these are really neat if you can have them in your practice because what this does is it actually measure, measures the ocular sagittal profile and it can help design fully a lens empirically. Um, so it's pretty good. Now remember with corneal topography, when you design lenses, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have a good image, you're not going to get a good design. Um, so the same thing with, with, with scleral topography. So imaging, the way that you image is very important. We actually have uh, two technicians in our office that are really good at our scleral topographer. And so we, we go ahead and we initiate them so that our images are consistent as possible. And, and these are really nice. You can either customize lenses completely with some laboratories other laboratories based on the, the profile will give you their best fit diagnostic. They'll take their diagnostic lens and they'll taper it in the certain meridians that need to be tapered in. And this is really nice, especially, you know, if you're concerned when we were in the height of COVID, we would be concerned about diagnostic fitting lenses is that you could ideally go ahead and just image 
with one of these imagers, get a lens, even though it doesn't have the right power, put it on the eye and then do an over refraction, then order the lens and then, you know, ship it directly, directly to the patient, you know, after, after you, you've looked at it. So these are really nice to have, not necessarily, you know, uh, an absolute, I still find because at least for me, I'm very particular with my images because I know if they're not good, I'm going to get a horrible product. So I make my text take multiple images. My text can fit a diagnostic fitting lens, scleral lens, much quicker than they can do one of these one of these scans. That's just me personally in my practice. I think that these they, they do have their place, but diagnostic fitting for me, um, and I think in most practices is is going to be the best best option in a in a busy practice. So this is new technology uh, recently, well, not uh, fairly recent on the market is um, 20, 2014 impression-based lenses have com come into play. And so this is really a good option for patients where you need to understand exactly all the intricacies of the, the, the scleral conjunctival shape. So, you know, with the, the tomographers and topographers, they are limited because the picture is, you know, there can be some artifacts, but in patients, especially if they have any alteration of the conjunctiva um, or sclera, and it's hard to get, you know, just a regular toric or a spherical lens on, and we want to understand that, 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 that curvature better is that you can do an impression. And so I typically use this on patients who have tube shunts, um, blebs, things that I'm trying to avoid. And um, what's interesting is that impression-based scleral lens fitting was actually the first way to fit scleral lenses when they were first created. Um, but it they stopped doing it because one, the, the, the impression material would burn the epithelium, wasn't safe for the epithelium. Two, scleral lenses weren't breathable enough. It wasn't until the 90s that the, the lenses became breathable enough. But now this technology is back. They use a, a special type of polyvinyl siloxin um, that is completely safe for the epithelium. It's safe for all the corneal structures and even on compromised um, corneas, I've used it on epithelial defects. And so what this does is it takes the impression of the eye, the impression then gets mailed to, to a manufacturer. They take a look at the, um, I'm sorry, they put into a 3D scanner where it then creates a digital image of the eye. And then there you can create a custom scleral contact lens um, completely in the periphery. This is very rare. I probably do, I don't know, um, maybe one or two to a month. So there's mostly you're going to use diagnostic fitting sets, but there is a place for, for, for more difficult eyes for such technology. So next, let's talk about insertion and removal and handling and application. Um, so these lenses are really big. The, the biggest barrier to getting a lens in the eye is the eyelids. You want to make sure that the patient has the eyelids as open as wide as possible. And there's different ways to insert the lens. Um, I really like to use my fingers because I can then feel where the lens is and physically, you know, for me, I'm dexterity wise, I'm able to handle the lens. And I try to teach my patients the tripod method because then there's less devices. But for patients who need, you know, have dexterity issues is that devices work well. There are plunger devices like the one here at the bottom where you go ahead and you can suction the lens on and then you push it up towards the eye and then you unsuction it and it applinates onto the eye. Um, or you can use one of these ring pop devices that actually can hold the lens with one finger and applinate it. Uh, there are also orthodontic devices, which are a little bit, they're like the finger, the, the finger rings, but for me, at least they're, they're a little bit harder, harder to use because sometimes they can come off balance, but it depends on, on the patient. I have a couple of patients who like the, the orthodontic bands. So application with solutions, we want to make sure that we use preservative free saline solution because we don't want to cause any toxicity. There's very minimal exchange between the lens um, fluid and the and beyond it, beyond the scleral lens. So that that stays trapped in there the whole entire day. 
Now, one thing I forgot to mention is that the, the saline solution has to physically be in the bowl of the lens because it contributes to the optical quality. If you've tried to put in a scleral lens without any saline solution, the patient won't be able to see. So that's very, that's very important that it's, that it's there. And also the weight of the lens is distributed by the saline. So it could move if there, there, there is an air bubble. We wanna make sure it's preservative free because we don't wanna cause any toxicity to the cornea. There's lots of solutions out there. Some of them are buffer free um, and some of them have buffers. Uh, there may be some questionable debate. There's some literature that maybe buffered buffered solutions, solutions that control for pH, um, could cause um, a um, epitheliopathy. I haven't really seen it. It really depends on the patient um, what they prefer. Um, I like to prescribe um, sodium chloride inhalation solution, 0.9%, because it's easy to get, and for lots of patients, it's on their generic copay, and it's very very inexpensive. So removal, we wanna make sure that the lens is well irrigated because this lens does suction onto the eye, it, it needs to be irrigated. And when we remove it, we wanna remove it from the periphery. If you try to stick the plunger in the middle of the lens, a small DMV removal plunger is that it'll create a lot of suction and this can be harmful. You need to remove the lens from the periphery. The patient should feel very little resistance to no resistance. If they feel resistance, they have the plunger in the wrong place or their eye is not wet enough. So disinfection is that there are dis disinfection systems. Hydrogen peroxide I really like um, because it's, it's available, uh, readily available at stores for both soft and hard lenses. There is also multi-purpose um, gas permeable lens solution. If the lens has touched something icky or if you think that there's any microbes on it, you can um, go ahead and kill acanth amoeba with a four hour of hydrogen peroxide soak. Also a solution um, called Progen does kill acanth amoeba. So the goal of scleral contact lenses for most of these patients is vision. Um, I want to go ahead and, and, and discuss that with scleral contact lenses, you can do a lot because the zone of vision is so large, you can manipulate the prescriptions to make them thicker or thinner uh, uh, because they raise above the corneal surface, you can manipulate them. You can add torix, so front torix, which are not stable on corneal lenses at all, or minimally stable, especially in high prescriptions. Um, you can add even prism, um, in, in more custom lenses in, in you know, any direction. You can also add multifocals and then also you can add aberration control and higher, higher order aberration wavefront correction guided control. So this is just a quick um, case report on a patient that I did with, with HOA correction is that you can fit a scleral lens do an aberrometry over it. And this aberrometry can be information can be transferred over to lab where it reads the higher order aberrations. And this can be placed on the front surface of the lens. And then for some patients, they find improved vision. It's not a panacea completely. Some patients don't, don't like looking through an HOA lens. Some patients um, because you're basically looking through a customized multifocal focal lens. And some patients can't get used to it. Some patients absolutely love it. And this patient was improved from 2030 to 2020 in, in, in his one eye. So a lot of times aberrometry is not available in, in practice. And so there are lenses that do have a set amount of aberrometry control, uh, um, sorry, aberration control or eccentricity on the front surface of the lenses that are available. And quickly, um, I want to go through. Let's let's go through the first um, and the last case report here. So this is a 15 year old Caucasian female that was referred to me by her pediatric ophthalmologist. She had something called congenital aniridia. So with congenital aniridia, what happens is these patients are born with the irises and their biggest complication for their cornea is they, get, they gain something called aniridic keratopathy, which basically is a type of congenital limbal stem cell deficiency. They also have all of this list of other concerns with their eyes. It's very rare and most cases are inherited. And so for the aniridic keratopathy, it causes limbal stem cell deficiency. And in this patient here in the picture, you can see after they've worn a scleral lens for several years, it does help their surface. 
So this young patient was, you know, really, the, her OMD was really concerned because she was so young. She was already starting to have limbal stem cell deficiency. She wanted to drive. She was 15 and she had this high um, refractive error. She also had nystagmus, a small cornea. She had cataracts already. And she, you know, she doesn't correct very well in glasses. And here are her corneal topographies. So you can see here, she does have limbal stem cell deficiency. You see the first stage. And then here's her transillumination defect from her iris and her, and her cataract. And so this is progressive. And so she was referred specifically for a scleral contact lens to help treat her aneritic keratopathy and protect the cornea. So she had a microcornea. I think her cornea was 10.8 millimeters. We went ahead and we stuck a first lens on there, which was 16.5, and this thing was ginormous. It was a full scleral lens that was overvaulted, decentered, um, 600 microns. It didn't look very good, but we refracted, and her vision improved significantly. So then what I did was I went to a smaller lens, a 15 millimeter lens, decreased the sagittal depth of the lens. This looked better. This was now um, clearing clearing um, the limbus, but there, the edge the edge wasn't well aligned. Is that there was edge lift? So what I did was I went ahead was I increased um, the ball 100 microns because we had 175 microns upon insertion. So we're moving that that um, for initial set settling. Excuse me, and we steepen the edge. And with this, because this lens was too flat on the left eye, only 50 microns, we increased the sagittal depth by 300 microns and the edge was also loose. So we steepened it 360 degrees around. And so with this lens, we did an over refraction and we were able to get her to 2016 each eye. And this is her with the scleral lens on. And we also use therapeutics. Serum tears are helpful for treating limbal stem cell deficiency. So we placed it in the bowl of the scleral lens. So I'm going to skip the next case, but I'd like to go to the last case, which I used a scleral topographer. So this is a patient who is um, high, who had LASIK, and she also formed ectasia and striae in the middle. And so her mother has a history of keratoconus. We placed a pair of scleral lenses on, and because of her, her profile, she had this high minus over refraction, minus, you know, 12-ish in both eyes. And I thought, you know what? I bet she could see better if we increase the size of the optic zone and we and we we go ahead and we make the lens fit more. So we know LASIK eyes have more of an oblate profile. So I did a scleral, scleral topographer, and this one actually measures based on fluorescein in different directions and it patches together a lens. Um, and so with this patient, we actually ended up going a lot flatter um, and 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 in the space curve and that took down minus and this patient was correctable to 2020 and 2025. And so if you don't have a scleral topographer in hand, there are diagnostic fitting sets that come in oblate styles and look at this flat, this flat base curve 9.5, I think is, I can't even remember, I think it was like 35 millimeters, which is incredibly flat. And that's gonna take down a lot of minus, remember flat add, add um, plus, so that's gonna take down and make the lens flatter. And so, and also open up the optic zone. So thank you so much for your time.